Um, so welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'm Max Katz. For those of you who joined uh, just for the afternoon session, I'm the um, NVIDIA technical contact to NERSC, um, and uh, it's my job to help uh, train everybody on how to use GPUs effectively. And so in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, profiling tools uh, for NVIDIA GPUs. Um, so this talk will be fairly specific to how do you do profiling on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, I think that most of the concepts apply generally to profiling um, on various architectures, and there are similar types of tools for um, other uh, GPU vendors and other CPU vendors, but today I'm really going to focus on what are the NVIDIA tool offerings for profiling, because I think that's your best first start uh, when you're getting started on GPUs. So um, the, the NVIDIA profiling tools uh, are broken up into a family of tools called the N-Site developer tools. And so um, the way this works is that we have a set of three tools that can be used for various parts of the uh, profiling analysis workflow. So whenever you first start analyzing the performance of a code, the most important question is where is the time being spent? Right? You want to be able to, as a function of wall time in your application, uh, ascertain how much is in each part of the program. Right? That's the most important thing. Because then you know what is your bottleneck, what is the most expensive part of your code, and usually that's the part that you then go and optimize. Right? Um, you don't want to optimize the part that's the most fun to optimize or the part that's easiest, right? You really, um, the most bang for the buck comes from the part that you're spending 60% of your time, if that's what you have. Um, <clears throat> of course, that's not always the easiest thing to do, right? Sometimes you can't do that or you need, it needs to wait on some of the refactoring. Um, but it's nevertheless always important to know where your time is being spent and so you don't go pre-optimize, right? You don't, you, before you go optimize some code, you need to have a very clear understanding of what is the possible benefit you can get from this. And if it already only takes 1% of your time, then spending your time on that part of the code doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? So. With that in mind, Insight Systems is the name of our tool that is designed to collect a timeline of the activity on your node. And so Insight Systems can be used for doing system-wide application analysis. So you're really answering, on my node, where is the time being spent? How much time is on the GPUs? How much time is on the CPUs? And like getting a, a stacked up view as a function of time, what's happening on your node? Then, once you've identified a particular part of your workload that is the problem, um, it often breaks down into two categories. One is that, um, you've identified that memory is your most important bottleneck, in particular copying data in between, back and forth between the GPU and the CPU. So Insight Systems will very clearly tell you whether that's happening or not. Um, and then sometimes the bottleneck is the actual compute workload. Um, I would say most of the time, the first time you port to GPUs, uh, it's going to be memory. That's your bottleneck. You either spend a lot of time allocating memory or copying it back and forth between the CPU and the GPU. Um, but once you've gotten that all worked out, typically your compute workload will then be the most important part of your time, and you want to analyze that. Now, on NVIDIA GPUs, discrete chunks of work are called kernels. Regardless of what programming language you use, there is a discrete chunk of work that gets launched on the GPU that has parallel work to do. In the CUDA context, that was the global function that we saw earlier. In OpenACC, that would be a specific parallel loop, right? Or same thing for OpenMP with a target team's uh, distribute uh, um, statement. So in, in the terminology of NVIDIA, those are kernels. And Insight Compute is designed to pick a particular kernel um, and analyze that. And so that's when you identified a particular loop that is the problem, that is your bottleneck now, and you want to understand what is the bottleneck for that loop, how can I optimize that loop. There's also another, and so the tool that is used to do that is called Insight Compute. Um, there's another tool called Insight gra uh, Graphics, which is for people who are doing like graphics optimization. I'm going to assume that that's not anyone in this room, but it is important for the people who do like game development on the NVIDIA platform. Um, of course, I'm only showing you the profiling part of the NVIDIA tool chain. Uh, Wusan uh, kindly showed you the debugging tools. There are a couple other tools as well, um, but I think for profiling and uh, debugging covers the most important part of the offerings. So Insight Systems, as I said, is designed to give you a timeline view of what happened in your application. Um, if you look on here uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, we have a kind of uh, screenshot of what this might look like for a fairly complicated application. Up here at the top of the image, you see uh, workload information about the CPU. Um, by the way, I'm going to give like a live demo of this tool after these slides are done, so don't, you don't have to squint, right? I'll, I'll make it a little bit easier to see, but I'm just giving you a sense of what you would see. Up here at the top, you have like the CPU workload. In the middle, you have information about uh, various APIs that uh, systems knows how to track. So it can track calls into CUDA, into the CUDA libraries. It can track MPI uh, calls, for example. Um, and then at the bottom, you have the actual GPU workloads. Um, and so that's what's down here, where you typically see red for memory activity and blue for kernels, the compute workload. 
And so that helps you distinguish at a kind of at a glance where is my time being spent? Is it in is it in memory? Is it in compute? Or am I not even running on the GPU? Which happens a lot more than you'd think, especially in the beginning. Um, Nsight Systems works in a in a separated host and target infrastructure where the target mode collects data on the remote system that you're running on, and then the host is used to actually visualize that data. So you can run it in a command line only mode where basically you just collect the data and then get like a standard out printout of what happened. But the more fun thing to do is collect a report on the remote system and then visualize it in the graphical interface. And that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how you, how you do both, but the second one is, is, gives you a much richer view. Uh, you get information like this that helps you see at a glance what's going on in your application. Um, the, uh, with some exceptions, uh, both versions are supported on Linux, Windows, and Mac. Um, the exceptions being on Mac, uh, there's only a, like a viewer version of this because um, you're not going to be running on your Mac. Um, and on Linux Power 9, which is what is running on Summit, for example, we only have the collection mode. So you'd have to, like, you do have to copy it back to your local system and then install NSI systems on your own and, and load it up. NSI Compute is the other half of this workflow, as I described. This is where you would um, go, once you identify that a particular kernel is your bottleneck now, you're going to jump into this tool, and it's going to do some analysis for you on what's going on. So under the hood, what it's doing is it's collecting hardware performance counters on the GPU. It runs your application, it collects these counters, it prints out a report, um, and then you can load that report into your user interface, and it'll tell you things like, Am I memory bandwidth bound? Am I compute performance bound? Or something else? And then hopefully you can use that to determine where should I go next in my optimization process. Um, so for using NSIDE systems, um, this is the command line interface that you would use. NSYS is the name of the binary. If you do module load CUDA on Cori, for example, this will be in the path, so you can just use it. Um, NSYS profile says collect, run this application and collect a profile. In this case, I've, it's a generic name, myapp.exe. And then if you add the dash dash stats equals true flag, uh, what that does is it says collect a report and also at the end post process it and give me a standard out view of like what happened. And I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. But basically it gives you a summary of all the activity that happened. Um, it's not like a ASCII implementation of the timeline. It's just a, a, a rolled up summary like the average of what, was, of what each activity uh, cost. It will generate a file that has the extension QDREP. Um, that's just the uh, the file extension, so you know uh, which ones are inside systems profiles. Um, and it is possible to use inside systems for interactive profiling. Like if you have a GPU on your local laptop or workstation, you can use it that way. But in the HPC center context, usually you collect the profile remotely and then view it locally. Um, and then you might get a view that looks like this when you, when you zoom in, where you see like the calls into the OS and, and kernel, calls into CUDA, and then call like the actual kernel. This is the, the bottom half of the screen is the, um, the actual GPU activity that shows you both kernels and compute operations. Um, if you zoom in even further, you can highlight over a particular kernel launch um, and then see information about it. So how long it took, what kind of resources it used on the GPU, that sort of thing. Um, so that's, that's basically the most detailed information you can get about that kernel. If you want any more detailed information, then you would need to jump into NSIGHT Compute, target that kernel, the name of that kernel, and then profile it. So that's the workflow. You would use this tool to highlight, find in your timeline a kernel that takes a long time, right, on your timeline, get the name of that kernel, and then profile it in NSIGHT uh, Compute. So for using NSIGHT Compute, and again, I'll demo this uh, in a moment, um, what you do, this is the name of the, um, the command line interface to NSIGHT Compute. It is NV NSIGHT CUCLI. It's a mouthful, I know. We're gonna make it simpler. Um, but for now, that's the name. And again, this will be in your path if you module load CUDA. Um, if you just run NV NSIGHT CUCLI dot myapp slash ESE, that will take a long time. And the reason it will take a long time is that it's going to profile every kernel in your application, which could be thousands or millions. Um, and unfortunately, because of the way NVIDIA GPUs are architected, and this might be true for every vendor, I'm not sure, we cannot collect an arbitrary amount of profiling information in one pass through your application. So the way we do this is we automatically rerun your kernels for you enough times in order to collect all that information. And that might be 50 times or 100 times. And so you can imagine that'll take a long, much longer time than your application normally runs. And so um, it is important to specify which kernels you want to profile or else you're just gonna be waiting forever for this profile. So the dash K option says, can accept a string which can be the subset or the a full match of your name the kernel name, it says anything, any kernel name who includes my kernel in it will be profiled. 
So you want to tune that carefully. And then you, there's further options you can do to even further limit the collection if it's taking a long time. Um, as with the Ensite systems, you can use Ensite Compute to actually drive the application if you have like a local workstation. But again, most of I think you, if you're running it at NERSC, will be doing it in the collect it on the command line remotely and then visualize it locally uh, workflow. Um, by the way, I haven't, these are generic slides, not specific to NERSC. So if you were running on NERSC, you need to run S run dash N1 and then, then the thing just so you, you know, because the GPUs aren't visible as we talked about from the, from the allocated node by default. And this is what the interface looks like for Ensite Compute. Um, again, I'll show you this in a moment, but um, it, it's broken down into a set of sections, and each section is intended to give you a different level of analysis on different parts of the GPU workflow. So the top level section, uh, it's probably the most important one for you to always start with, it's called the speed of light section. The speed of light section is intended to tell you um, of the various theoretical bottlenecks on the hardware, how close are you getting to matching those theoretical bottlenecks, right? So, um, we published that if you're using double precision floating point multi fuse multiply adds, then the peak um, performance of a uh, Volta GPU is something on the order of seven teraflops, right? So this would tell you if you had an application that was primarily doing that instruction, what percentage of that seven teraflops did my kernel actually get, right? So that gives you a sense of how much more optimization do I need to do before I hit a hard limit on the GPU beyond which I cannot get any faster and I should move on and, and work on another kernel. So this is intended to do that. Um, the speed of light, there, therefore, is the, the, the peak possible performance, and the percentage of that is how much did you achieve. Um, and it will do, it will, there are several different, now for memory it gets a little bit more complicated, because there are different levels of memory hierarchy as we discussed. There's what's called global memory, which is basically your DRAM. That's the big chunk of memory the GPU has, 16 gigs. There's also levels of cache. And any one of those could be your bottleneck, right? The, the, if, if you're doing a streaming operation, like str summing two long arrays together, that typically will be bottlenecked by how long it takes to go to DRAM, because the size of the arrays will be much larger than the size of your cache. Um, but if you're doing something that can fit in cache, then you will primarily be bottlenecked by what is the bandwidth to the cache, or latency to the cache. And so um, the, high, the memory hierarchy has different levels, and so it shows you the, um, what percentage of each level you're at. So in this uh, screenshot example, um, it's telling you that, um, and the, the, the nomenclature is a little bit unfortunate or hard, hard to parse for, for beginners, but basically it's telling you for L1 cache, L2 cache, and for the DRAM, what percentage of each of those did you get? And approximately speaking, your, your total limiter will be essentially the highest of those three, right? Because the, the, the highest number you get is the, is the bottleneck, right? If you could make that number faster, then that would become the thing that makes your, your kernel run faster. Okay, so uh, as a general rule, and this is getting more into the weeds perhaps, you'll have, need to build up some more experience with this, but as a general rule, an a, a kernel that looks like this is not an efficient use of the GPU's resources. It's not getting near the 100% that you'd like to get um, for either compute, which is the upper bar graph, or memory, which is the lower bar graph. As a general rule, if you can get 60 to 70% of one of those, we typically say that you're bound by that system. Right, so if you're 60 or 70 percent of memory bandwidth, then you're you're reasonably memory bandwidth bound, and at that point, uh, you need to focus on like better coalescing memory accesses, or reducing the, the reliance on memory, or buying a more expensive GPU that has more memory bandwidth. Um, whereas the if, if you're compute bound, which is the upper row, um, then that means like you're limited by how fast, how many double precision instructions we can get through, or something. And again, typically you want to be at 60 or 70 percent of that before you can conclude that now you're limited by how how much math can we actually do. Compute bound is ideally where you want to be because the peak performance of the GPU is in the compute bound regime. Um, when Jack talked about roofline analysis earlier, that's what he was really getting at, that if you're memory bandwidth bound, you will never reach that peak performance of the GPU. So the more compute heavy you can make your kernel, the better. Of course, there's lots of algorithms that don't expose themselves that way at all, right? But as, a, as an ideal, that's where you want to be. Okay, before I jump into the demo, any questions about the profiling options? Yes. So uh, on the previous uh, slide, um, it, does it mean that the top row has to be um, larger, as large as possible compared to the <coughs> bottom row? The question was, should I interpret this as saying that the top row should be as large as possible relative to the bottom row? I.e., should I have, should I try to be bottlenecked by compute rather than memory? And, and my comment is, that's the ideal world where you're bounded by compute, and if you are bounded by compute, often you will not be bound by memory because you're not gonna be making that many accesses to memory because you have a lot of compute instructions to do. Um, 
so that's the ideal world. But don't necessarily make that a goal of your optimization because if you are trying to add two arrays together, the example I gave, you can never make that compute bound, right? The best you can do is make it memory bandwidth bound and then just optimize that as much as you can by doing things like making sure that memory accesses are coalesced and that you're achieving as close to 100% as possible. Anything else? Yes. If you were hitting CPU memory here, would it show that? Um, if you if you were trying to read data from CPU memory as in your kernel, then yes, that that would be determined as a limiter. That's right. Okay. So, um, how much time do I have left? Twelve minutes. That's fine. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick demo, and I don't have enough time to like do this full justice, but just to give you a flavor. Um, and this is something you might be able to do for homework or not maybe later, not today necessarily, it's a little bit more advanced. But if you want to follow up exercise, you can do that. Um, oh, it's 2.30? Okay. Um, so um, Matt Norman uh, is a climate scientist at Oak Ridge and has developed a, um, a mini app called Mini Weather. And so Mini Weather is, is a simple uh, C or Fortran based um, CFD type code that can be used basically for the type of analysis you would do for weather or climate simulations. So he kindly made that available to the community in an open source code. It's a nice mini app to play with if you want to get familiar with what that community's code looks like. And so that's the type of thing that like vendors would typically go off and try to optimize for procurements and that sort of thing. Um, mini weather is an excellent code for doing various types of analysis. Um, and I have chosen to fork it and make it, and I made a version of it that is I use for doing, for demonstrating um, performance analysis. And so um, this is on my personal GitHub. I can tell you how to, it's in a branch called MCAT slash tutorial. So like follow up with me afterwards or I can make it available on the nurse documentation, something like that. Um, but this is something you can go to on GitHub and get. Uh, and it just gives you a few simple problem exercises that you can work on. And as you can see, I was working on this Frantically while Wusun was talking, I'm sorry. Um, but I was just trying to touch it up. Um, and so what I've done is I've broken it down in a set of five problems, uh, with two, three of which exercise Ensite systems and two of which ex exercise Ensite compute, with the idea that if you go through them linearly, you'll kind of learn this workflow of using Ensite systems to get a pro uh, profile of the tool, a timeline of the tool, um, and then identifying what the bottleneck is, and then removing that bottleneck. I've given you some hints to make that not too hard. Um, and then uh, eventually you get to the point where now kernels are your limiter, and then use Ensite Compute to profile the kernel. So I'm not gonna go through all five of those. I don't think we have time for that. And I also want to give you something to do. Um, but I'll give you a sense of how that workflow works, and I'll show you how to use both tools. So I have uh, cloned this repository on Cori. Um, and I'm, I have currently allocated a node on query with salloc the way we described before. Um, so you can see I did, if I do this, uh, I get the GPU that's available to me. So I just have, I've requested one GPU and that's all that I need. For this, mini weather itself is an MPI uh, code. I stripped out all the MPI from my version of it just for simplicity. Um, so you can focus on just the single GPU performance. If I, if I ls here, um, this is the structure. Those are, I have five problems, which I just have in text files. And then what I've done is for each problem, I provided a git patch file. So if you get stuck and you just want to see what was my solution to that problem, you can just do git apply um, solution one dot patch. And then that will basically solve it in a sense so that you can then move on with the pro tool part of the analysis. Um, so in order to build this, you just type make. It requires having the PGI compiler in your environment. Um, this is an open ACC accelerated code. I basically, uh, from Matt Norman's code, stripped out everything but the C, OpenACC implementation. Um, and then, so that requires a PGI compiler. For, on core, you just do module load PGI. And again, ask me if you want, if you're confused on any of these, just ask me afterwards so I can run you through the workflow. Um, so now I have a mini weather um, executable, and I can just run it with srun. Um, the way that this works, uh, by the way, is that text? Um, Oh, so the question was, do people use the NV top tool a lot? This is a tool that I only learned about last week. Uh, I think it might have been released somewhat recently or something because I saw it on like several Slack teams being commented. Um, basically, NV top is like a, as, as from the 30 seconds that I looked at it, it's a tool that allows you to see like a time graph representation of the utilization of the GPU. And so um, if you do NVIDIA SMI, there's a number here uh, this basically gives you a status report on the GPU 
Uh, I know this is divergent, but this is a useful diversion. Um, and the status report tells you things like what is the temperature of the GPU? Um, this is its total potential power draw, 300 watts for Volta V100, and this is the current power draw, so it's basically idling at this point. This is the total amount of memory available. This is the current amount of memory allocated. And then this number here th is the GPU utilization. It's a very crude measure of how heavily you're hitting the GPU. And basically it says, in my last one second of time, of all time, uh, what fraction of the time was I spending running on the GPU? So if this is at 100%, it basically says you're running a continuous workload on the GPU. So you can often use that for your various highest level um, questions like, am I even running on the GPU? That's a useful thing to do. Um, and if I am using the GPU, am I only spending like 2% of the time on the GPU and the rest is presumably then on the CPU? Um, so NVIDIA SMI has a mode, a couple different modes. Uh, one of them is called the daemon mode, where basically every second it will print out a bunch of stats like this. And I believe that NVTOP is basically just a wrapper on this that runs this in this mode and then shows it to you into a nice graphical interface. So if you want to, you can often do something like in a separate window, separate terminal window, load this up, right? Or you could do, um, uh, like you can be more simple with Linux, right? You can just do like watch N1 NVIDIA SMI and then just have it refresh every one second. Um, and, then that, and then in a second, second terminal window, and then your first terminal window, run your application. That is the quickest way usually to see, did I even run on the GPU? So if you're terminals, you're accessing the same GPU, um, that I, don't, I mean, yes. Uh, on most platforms, I don't know how this works on NERSC specifically, but on most platforms you can do like SALIC to get a node and then just open a separate terminal and SSH directly to that node. So that's one thing you can do. I don't, I don't know if NERSC, like what, how, how that works in NERSC, but in general that's a thing that can be done at HPC centers. And you typically don't want to be doing that that often because there's just more to c work with, but it is a way to get around the fact that with, with Slurm, you can only have one S run task going at a time. So you can't S run your program and then also S run NVIDIA SMI at the same time. So that's, that's a trick that I use to get around it. Um, if that is not currently documented on the Cori docs, we'll make sure we have uh, described that workflow in case you're curious. Okay. So that was an aside on NVTOP and uh, performance monitoring. Um, but that's a very crude metric, right? It only tells you, was the GPU active essentially, right? We want to get better information than that. We want to get like, what, what actually happened on the GPU? So um, I ran MiniWeather and it gives me a counter of where I am in time. Uh, it tells me what the time step is. This is like a CFD grid code. So it uh, advances up to a particular time step. And the first two numbers, NX glob and NZ glob are uh, the number of zones, and this is a two-dimensional grid code, so it's X, X zones and Z zones, so it's a total of 800 zones in, in the current version of the code in the simulation. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run NSYS profile um, on this application, and NSYS is, a, is the binary for NSYS, NSYS systems, as we discussed, so that will do two things for me. One is that it will give me it will capture to disk a report file that is like a, like a binary opaque thing that records all the events that the NSYS system has captured. And then the second thing that it does is it then post processes that report and it gives me um, a list of everything that happened. So this can be a little bit, um, it's, it's wide, so like you might want to pipe it to a file and then um, look at it. But basically what it does is it gives you um, several different sections on memory operations and kernels. Remember kernels are the compute workloads. <coughs> so if I um, scroll up to the top, um, what I see is these set of sections. So this is the top of my report. So the first section is the CUDA API. So the CUDA API is what the CPU calls to launch work or do things on the GPU. And that's broken down into memory allocations, memory transfers, and then what we call kernel launches, which is actually launching the work on the GPU. Um, and it's broken, it's ordered in descending order by amount of time. So basically what this row is telling me here is that of the CPU calls into CUDA, not the, not the runtime of the application, just of the parts of CUDA API that were tracked, 98% of that was in this API call, QMEM host alloc, which you know, I don't expect you to recognize, but basically is memory allocating, right? So this is uh, a, a symbol that is called when you do CUDA malloc or some other like open ACC, ACC data create or, or open MP map or, or something like that. that. That's the memory allocator that it's called. So the, it's dominated in terms of the CPU view into it by um, memory allocation. From kernels, it gives you a, time, a descending list of all the kernels that were ran on the GPU. OpenACC and OpenMP have a nice property that they tend to generate nice, kernel, nice, nice looking kernel names that are the name of the function. In this case, this is the name of a function in the code set hello value Z. 
and then a line number in the code. So that's super useful for like locating where that loop was. Um, and if you're doing like templated C++ code, these names are not as fun. Um, and basically this tells you that of the time spent on the GPU, running work on the, compute work on the GPU, about half was spent in this set halo value z function. It tells you um, how many time in nanoseconds, uh, how much time in nanoseconds was spent in that, how many times it was called, and like the average uh, and min and max for that kernel. Is this inclusive? Like, is this calling other functions? No, these, these are, each kernel is independent. So if you sum them up, it'll get 100%. Uh, and then finally down here, you have memory operations. So these are transfers between the CPU and the GPU. And um, basically what it tells you is that about half of that time was spent in, in CPU to GPU transfers, which we call host to device or H to D, and then about half in the other direction. Now, if you added up these various sections in nanoseconds, you could make some inferences about where was my time mostly being spent. Um, and you could do that, or what you could do is just load it up into the graphical interface, which is what I'm gonna recommend that you do. And so if I look in my directory, I now have report1.qdrep. So that is my generated report file. So I have a second terminal window open here. And then what I'm going to do is, I'm, I'm just gonna choose the workflow of SCPing the file down to my laptop and then viewing it in my local viewer. That's a pretty common workflow. So if I print my working directory, this is where I am on Cori. So I'm gonna copy that path um, and then copy this file down to my laptop. And hopefully I will type things correctly. I will forget, I will not forget that this is on Cori. <laughs> so now I've copied that down to my system. I already have Nsight systems uh, opened up in my laptop. If you want to get this, it's a free download. Use Google and Nsight systems and you'll find the, the download link. Yes? So does uh, Nsight replace uh, NVPROF or am I misunderstanding? So the question was, does Nsight systems replace NVPROF? Um, for those of you who have done GPU programming on NVIDIA before, um, there is a, an existing profiling tool called NVPROF and a, and a paired graphical interface called NVIDIA, NVIDIA Visual Profiler, NVVP. Um, and the answer is yes, uh, that tool is now in what I would call maintenance mode. It is not supported for, essentially we've stopped uh, active feature development as of the current GPUs of Volta. Um, and then the next generation GPUs that will be on Perlmutter, uh, this will be the only supported profiling tool. So basically that's why I'm showing you this tool. Um, the current profiling tool works on Core GPU, NVPROF. Um, it's not, you know it works, there's no, there's no bugs that I know about. Um, you're welcome to use it. Um, but I'm, show, I'm intentionally showing you the, the tools that will be supported on Perlmutter. So I, I open up this report one.qdrep file and I get a timeline view like the following. Um, it's broken down into two sections as I said uh, earlier. The top part here um, is the CPU workload. So like this black bar here is a measure of load on the CPU. If it's, if it's the bar is at 100%, that basically means I'm hitting CPU threads heavily. Whereas like here towards the beginning, I'm just start, starting to spin up my application. Um, the CUDA API is on this row. So this is telling you all the calls into CUDA. Um, there's a big chunk here for QM host Alex. So that kind of lines up with our um, thing we saw before. Um, and that's telling you that of the time spent um, in the CUDA API, most of it's in that memory allocation. But now we can see that this is a pretty darn big chunk of the application runtime as a whole, right? The, the entire runtime is from the left bar here to the bar on the right, and it's 800 milliseconds. Um, so yeah, it'll come back up, I'm sure. Well, I'm not sure, but I hope. Um, I don't know what I can do. I mean, I'm not connected to it, I'm just connected to Zoom. Okay, sorry about that. For those on WebEx, we're just screen difficulties. <laughs> or Zoom, sorry. Um, yeah. um, so 800 milliseconds, you can see a big chunk of that. I can, I can um, do something like this to highlight a section um, and look at the timeline, and I see that that's you know, um, like 300 milliseconds. That's, a, that's almost half of my runtime is spent in this memory allocation. Um, and then the second part down here, the CUDA section, is where the actual runtime occurs. So I can expand this, um, and there, it's broken down to kernels, which is the compute, and memory, which is the memory transfers. And if you look, if you have sharp eyes, you can see all of it is right there. All of the compute workload is right there in that part of the application. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty tiny, right? That means this application is not spending much time on the GPU. Um, and the main message here that I would take away from looking at this profile, and this is basically exercise one in my tutorial, is this is not a workload that works well on the GPU. Even if every one of those kernels is optimized, it's fully optimized, it cannot be better, you've written the best possible CUDA, this does not make sense to run on the, on the GPU. 
this workload will be faster on the CPU, for sure. Um, and it comes down to two things. One, it takes time to spin up CUDA, or the, the GPU in general. It takes like something like half a second to one second to actually get everything loaded onto the GPU. And second, memory allocation is really expensive on GPUs. Um, there's fundamental hardware reasons why that's true. Um, and so basically, it is much more expensive to allocate memory on GPUs than you're familiar with on CPUs. And so if you're dwarfed by the amount of time you have it takes to allocate the memory, and you only spend a tiny amount of time running with it, that's not a good use of your time. Um, so think carefully for a second. What is the answer then? How do I make this application run well on GPUs? Anybody want to I mean, volunteer a guess? What can I do, given the things I just said? Okay, so there was a suggestion to use shared memory. And I have already asserted to you that every one of those kernels is as good as it can be. So I cannot use any memory optimization techniques on the GPU to make them faster. Run it on, okay, run it on the CPU, right. And that, that's the answer for this workload, right? This would be faster on the CPU. But the trick, the trick answer to that question is make the problem bigger, right? This is my fundamental argument that you should not, cannot run small workloads on the GPU. In almost every part of science that I can think of, there is a way to make your, your problem more expensive by giving it more work and having it be higher fidelity, right? If it's a grid code, you give it more zones, so it's more work, but it's usually a higher resolution, higher fidelity thing, right? If you're doing molecular dynamics, right, you, you add more atoms, right? You know, there's all sorts of things you can typically do to add more work uh, to, at the ex cost of making it more computation expensive, but also higher accuracy, higher fidelity. And so that is what you do for GPUs. You do not run this problem. You do not run this version of the problem. You run a bigger version of that same problem. And you run that problem until it's big enough that now this, part, this little tiny chunk here is the entire runtime. Is it just making it bigger, or is it making it bigger by making the ratio of zones per GPU core? Um, I literally mean exposing more work. So if we look at that output. Um, because if it's still the same number of GPU cores to do the calculations and everything, how is it faster? Right. That, so the question is if the number of GPU cores stays fixed, how can adding more work make it any faster? And the answer is it's a great question. Uh, and the answer is basically this. I told you before there are 800 zones to work on. So that's basically 800 degrees of freedom in the application. And the fact is that NVIDIA GPUs can have 100,000 threads resident at one time. So we're not actually using all the cores right now. So that's how we make this faster. The rule of thumb is if you have 100,000 to a million degrees of freedom in your application, you, have a, you stand a good chance of saturating the GPU's compute capability. If you're anything below that, you're not using the GPU well, give up and go home. Well, don't go home. Make your problem bigger. Um, <laughs> Right, it is, right, it, absolutely. The, the comment was you can run into memory issues, and that's right. You might make a problem so big that now you don't even fit on the GPU. And I agree, that's sometimes a problem. Usually, for something that's like 100,000 degrees of freedom, that usually you can fit that into memory kind of generically for all of the science applications I know. But if you make it big enough, you, you, that is a problem. And that is a problem that is much more serious on GPUs than on CPUs. Uh, that's outside the scope of this talk, but that's a great point. Okay, so that was Insight Systems. Um, and the, the exercise in the tutorial, which you can, yes, what's, your, what's up? I, I was going to ask, have you know, people tried this at NERS? Because the example of this one is MV Prof, which worked by just tried running um, NSYS profile. It doesn't have the stats equals true. Okay. Uh, right. So, so the question was, does, has this actually been tested at NERSC? Um, I'm promising you that it is because I'm literally doing this at NERSC right now on the core GPU node, so I promise it works. Um, that said, um, there is an issue where um, the stats equals true option was added in like a somewhat recent version of Insight Systems, and the CUDA module determines which version you get. So if I do module list, you see I have CUDA 10.2.89. If you have something else in your environment, like an older version of CUDA, and maybe that's what the docs recommend, then that's the issue. LRBRG and the LRBM loads the older CUDA. I think in the rate if I said switch to the newer CUDA to use Insight. Okay, gotcha. Yes, I think that is documented there. Yep. Um, so. I recommend using the newest CUDA, except in cases where you can't because of compatibility issues. And then, and if you run into that case, use the other one to compile, but then module switch into this to do the, use the profiler, and that generally works. Okay, um, so I have a couple minutes left. I just want to talk about inside compute. So you, you're, you do my exercises, and now, somehow, um, you have made it such that the, the kernels are now the most important part of your application, right? Once you've gotten to that point, then you, you, I permit you to then look at one of those kernels in inside compute. So I can zoom in, 
on uh, this part of the application. Um, I'm using control and pinch motion to zoom in. Um, it's easier if you have a mouse on a scroll wheel. Uh, I can zoom far enough in that I start finding individual kernels. And you can see there's a tiny on the timeline of the application. Sorry about that. Um, and um, yeah, you might want to follow along on the WebEx, on the Zoom, sorry. Um, but I, I am highlighting over uh, a kernel, and it gives me information. And I, hi I highlight over one randomly, and I'm going to say, that's the one that now takes the most time. And in this case, I happen to highlight over Compute Tendencies X. So let's pretend that Compute Tendencies X is the most important kernel that now that you've done your, your refactoring. That's not annoying, isn't it? Um, So now what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to profile this with Nsight Compute. So I have given, given the dash K option and picked a particular kernel name, and then it will profile all invocations of that kernel. You can see this already taking a lot longer than it used to. Um, because each one is being run 17 times. That's the number on the right. So I'm now profiling every instance of that kernel is being profiled 70, 17 times. So it's actually going to take a little bit longer. And it happens to be the case that there are actually two um, functions that have compute tendencies X in them, so it's profiling both of them. Um, when, it does, when it runs multiple times, uh, how the data, I mean, the initial data is saved in the software and then it reloads the Yeah, we save the initial state and then load it back um, to ensure program r remains valid. That's right. Um, if you abort in the middle, which I got tired and did, you'll get a standard out, like ASCII printout of a whole bunch of things, which basically are the same thing that the UI would give you if you loaded the report. So in order to make life simpler, and because I have one minute left, I'm going to intentionally profile only one kernel. So dash C1 means only profile one, one instance of that kernel. Um, and then what I'm going to do is um, store this in a file. So I'm going to say uh, mini weather. And so you now you see, instead of giving me standard out to ASCII, I have now created a file. And it has this extension, which again is a mouthful. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to copy that down. I'm going to go a couple minutes over. I hope nobody gets mad at me. Um, just a couple minutes. Um, copy that down. And now I have my report file. I open up the Nsight Compute user interface, which I've already pre-opened. Uh, it looks like this. You go to File, Open File. Don't go to Open Project. Um, and then do Open My Mini Weather Nsight Compute Report. And so finally, this is the view that I gave you a screenshot of like half an hour ago. Um, and this gives me several sections that give me different levels of analysis. And I'm just going to stay on this one for the sake of time. This is the GPU speed of light, light section that I showed you. And basically, this tells me, if I look at these bar graphs, these tell me that I am using 1% of my peak memory uh, bandwidth and 1% of my peak compute. So is that a good use of my GPU or bad use of my GPU? Yeah, that's not a great use of the GPU, right? You don't, you, this is a latency-bound kernel, right? Latency-bound is, is generally when you're not memory bandwidth bound or you're not compute bound, so we're bound by latency. Remember I said that GPUs are a latency-hiding processors. Any one operation is very high latency. It takes hundreds of cycles to go to global memory, to DRAM. Um, but we can hide that by having lots of work ready to go so that at any one clock cycle, the work that is ready to go can go. This thing only has 800 zones of work to do, this problem. But we have 100,000 threads that we could be doing. So like 0.1% of my threads, potential threads, are active. No, 1%. 1% of my potential threads are active. And so it kind of makes sense that I'm only getting something like 1% of the peak compute uh, or memory bandwidth, right? I cannot ever achieve the compute per peak performance because that peak performance is relying on having enough threads going to high latency to achieve that peak. And so when you see something like this, you know you're latency bound. In this particular case, the answer is add more work, right? So um, make the big grid bigger, right? That's the answer for this problem. But sometimes, that's, sometimes there are other limiters, and the tool will help you, I think, guide you through that process. So that's the very high-level overview. I just wanted to let you know that these tools exist and that you should make them part of your workflow. Um, the most important thing to do when you start running on the GPU is profile, right? In fact, you should profile even before you get on the GPU. Use anti-systems to collect a profile of your application. Have that be the, the baseline so that when you start putting things on the GPU, you see, did it get faster or slower? 
And I'm going to warn you, first time it's going to get slower, right? Uh, be because you allocated memory that took too long or um, you're doing too much memory transfer, right? So I'm, don't get bummed, right? That's a normal part of the process. Profile it, see what your bottleneck is, and then work to eliminate that. But either exposing more parallelism or doing things like more effectively reusing memory, that sort of thing. Um, putting more work in a row so that memory doesn't have to transfer back and forth. So you'll learn these techniques as you go. I just want you to let you know these tools are, exist to help you do it. Use them rather than try to be God and read your source code and figure out what's going on. That's a very hard thing to do. Any questions? Yes? Is the kernel name what you have called the kernel? It's not the kubloss or whatever. The kernel name is what the compiler gave to it. And it happened to be that OpenACC and OpenMP give you nice looking names. Okay. And kubloss does not give you nice looking names. Right. Um, so that is a thing that I cannot get around. Um, I will say that there are, there's a light at the end of the tunnel for that thing, uh, which we can discuss offline. But for now, it's basically whatever name the compiler generates, and you can, as long as you identify a substring of that, you can give it to dash K, um, but it may be a pretty gnarly name. So Cocos is famous for generating kernel names that are literally 2,000 characters long, and like breaking some tools like Intel uh, for, for, for having done that in the past. So that may not be fun, and I, I apologize for that, but we're working on that. Does Nsight, can somebody read out the question? Does Nsight profile tool work with high number? Right, so the question was, does Nsight, do the Nsight tools work on other uh, p platforms like Python, for example, CUDA Python? The answer is yes. The nice thing about the NVIDIA platform is that all of the programming models go through the same underlying level of CUDA. And so everything generates CUDA kernels when it does work, right? A CUDA kernel can be generated from CUDA C or it can be generated from CUDA Python or Numba or CUPI. And so every tool can be profiled, every, every program model that runs on NVIDIA GPUs can be profiled this way. Not all of the integration will be the same. So it may be easier to like, correlate lines of source code from C to, uh, in the profiler than it would be from Python. So that part is different, maybe. But the, overlying, the underlying concept of being able to look at it, get a timeline of, the, of you, and target particular kernels with inside compute can be done independent of programming language. Yes? Um, if we want to run the visualization on our laptop, do we have to join the NVIDIA developer program, or is there a? Yes, but that is a free program. It's, it's just uh, somebody in our marketing team decided that they wanted to collect that information. So you do have to join the developer program to do it. The other thing is we have NSA systems installed on Cori. So if you had VNC or X-Forwarding, you could go that path by just loading the user interface remotely. Um, if you're very close to the system, that can be OK, can be tolerable. If you're, doing it, if you're halfway across the country, the X-forwarding is pretty rough for these applications. And I highly recommend just biting the bullet, SCPing it down to your, your system, download, registering to the developer program, downloading that tool, and then running it. And that's free download? It's a free download. You just, just need to create an account. That's right. All right, thanks, everyone. <laughs>